We hope that you all have a safe and healthy Thanksgiving this year. Because of the pandemic, it may not be the Thanksgiving you want. However, at least it will be better than the three Thanksgivings in this video. Before we start today's video, we want to bring you a word from our amazing sponsor, Magellan TV. The other day, I was scrolling through Magellan TV, and I noticed that they added a documentary series I used to watch on TV, and I loved it. It's called Urban Legends. In each episode, there are three stories. At least one of the stories is true, another one is false, and the third could be either. It's up to the viewer to figure out which stories are factual and which are fictional. It's a really interesting spin on true crime stories, plus they talk about fascinating urban legends. Urban Legends is a great example of why Magellan TV is so great. I had been looking for urban legends on other platforms, and Magellan TV was the only one who had it. They have a lot of great documentaries you can't find anywhere else. Magellan TV has over 3,000 documentaries in many different genres, like science and history. They have a great selection of documentaries about some of the most evil people who ever lived. Magellan TV can be watched anywhere, at any time, on your TV, laptop, or mobile device. You can cast from your phone to your TV. It works with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, iOS, Google Play, and so many more. Magellan TV has a special offer for criminally listed viewers. Just go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed and you'll get a month for free. Please help support criminally listed and find something interesting to watch by checking out Magellan TV. Number 3. Terry Lynn Hollis In the autumn of 1972, Terry Lynn Hollis was 11 years old. She lived in Torrance, California with her parents and her three siblings. On Thanksgiving afternoon, she was riding her bike in front of her family's home. When it was time to come inside, her family discovered that she was missing. Hours later, she was reported missing. Throughout the night, the police searched for her, but no trace of Terry was found. The next morning, her partially clad body was found about 60 miles east of her home. Her body was on some rocks at the bottom of an embankment beside the ocean. Had it been high tide, the water would have been above the rocks. The medical examiner determined that Terry had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. A massive investigation was launched. Several people said that they saw Terry riding her bike with a man shortly after she was last seen in front of her home. Their descriptions resulted in this sketch. The man was described as being between the ages of 18 and 24. He was about 5'9 to 6 feet tall and he weighed 180 to 200 pounds. The detectives questioned over 2,000 people. In February 1974, about 15 months after the murder, the police arrested a 20-year-old man and charged him with Terry's murder. But a few months later, the charges were dropped. Neither the police nor the district attorney's office explained what evidence led to the man being charged or why the charges were dismissed. Decades went by and no other arrests were made. Terry's parents and two of her siblings passed away without ever finding out who killed her. Then, in September 2018, 47 years after the murder, the police made a major announcement. Using the killer's DNA, Parabon Nano Labs found a relative of the killer. Then they traced the killer's family tree with public genealogy databases and they narrowed it down to a single suspect. They said that Terry's killer was a man named Jake Edward Brown. Brown had died 16 years earlier in 2003 in Arizona at the age of 66. The police had his body exhumed and a DNA sample was taken. It was a match to the DNA of Terry's killer. 
Jake Brown would have been 36 years old at the time of Terry's murder. The police had very little information about Brown's past. For example, they don't know where he was living at the time of the murder. He may have been a drifter, or he could have been passing through Torrance. Brown also used different aliases. For example, his birth name was Thomas Tracy Burham. What is known is that Jake Brown had a criminal record. He had been arrested for narcotics and robbery. In April 1973, five years after Terry's murder, he was arrested for rape. He was arrested again for rape a year later, in April 1974. However, it's not known what the results of those arrests were. The police said they are investigating the possibility that Brad was responsible for other murders. Over 10 years before Terry was killed, there were two very similar kidnappings in Torrance. On August 18, 1961, 11-year-old Karen Lynn Tompkins disappeared on her way home from school. Her body has never been found. Eleven months later, on July 3, 1963, 11-year-old Dorothy Gale Brown was riding her bike close to her mobile home in Torrance. At some point, her parents realized she was missing and they got in contact with the police. The area was searched, and her bike was found abandoned not far from where she had been riding it. The next morning, a skin diver found Dorothy's body in the ocean about 40 miles southwest of where she was last seen. She had been sexually assaulted, and the cause of death was drowning. The police immediately suspected that Dorothy and Karen's murders were connected. Both victims were 11 years old, and they both had blonde hair. They lived and were kidnapped within blocks of each other. Their murders were still unsolved when Terry was killed. People immediately recognized the similarities between all three crimes. Terry was also 11 years old, and she had light hair. Like Karen, Terry had been kidnapped while she was riding her bike in front of her home. Karen's body was found in the ocean, about 40 miles southeast of where she was last seen. Terry's body was dumped about 60 miles west of her home. Her body was dumped on an embankment beside the ocean. Had it been high tide, her body would have been in the water. Both dump sites are close to California State Route No. 1. Finally, Terry lived about five miles from the other two girls. A major difference between the crimes is that Karen and Dorothy's murders happened a decade before Terry was killed. Jake Brown would have been in his mid-twenties when the earlier murders happened. But it's unknown where Brown was living when these murders happened. Since announcing Jake Brown killed Terry Hollis in September 2019, the police have not made any further announcements regarding other crimes he may have committed. Number 2. Paul Marriage Paul Marriage was born in September 1974. Two years later, his mother gave birth to a set of twin daughters, Lisa and Carla. For high school, Paul attended a private school in Miami, Florida. Paul was a bright young man, and he was involved in the school's athletics. He played football, baseball, and soccer. When he graduated, he was third in his class. His plan was to attend the University of Miami and eventually become a doctor. Paul was accepted into his university of choice, and he started attending classes. But then, when Paul was 19, he had a mental breakdown. He suffered from severe depression. He was also diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. 
This led to him dropping out of school. Because of his OCD, Paul would repeatedly shower and shave. He also had problems making decisions. His OCD made it difficult for him to hold down jobs. Another problem was that Paul wouldn't take his medication regularly. Before Paul had his breakdown, he seemed to have a good relationship with his family. But afterward, his family feared him. In 2006, his sister, Carla, filed a restraining order against him because he had threatened to kill her. However, she had the order dropped three weeks later. In the lead up to Thanksgiving 2009, Paul kept asking his parents what the plans were for the holiday. They told him that year, the family's Thanksgiving get-together was being hosted by Jim and Muriel Sitton. Muriel was Paul's cousin. They lived in a gay community in Jupiter, Florida. On Thanksgiving afternoon, Paul called his mother, Carol, who was already at the gathering, and he told her that he was on his way. Carol said to her daughter, Lisa Knight, I hope he doesn't come and kill us all tonight. Lisa told her mother that she had the same fear. When Paul arrived, there were 16 family members at the gathering. For three hours, the family celebrated. They ate and sang songs around the piano. 35-year-old Paul joined in in all the activities and no one knows anything off about him. At one point, Paul slipped away from the party and went out to his car. What the family didn't know was that Paul had six guns he had recently purchased in his car. When Paul returned to the party, he shot his twin sisters, 33-year-old Lisa Knight and 33-year-old Carla Marriage. Lisa was pregnant. Paul also shot Lisa's husband, Patrick Knight. Paul then shot his 76-year-old aunt, Ramon Joseph, in the shoulder and she fell to the floor. Her husband tried to cover her body and stop the bleeding. Paul walked up to his aunt, held a gun to her sternum and shot her again. He then aimed the gun at his uncle and pulled the trigger twice. But the gun didn't fire either time. Paul walked away from his uncle and said, I've been waiting 20 years to do this. Paul then went into the bedroom of six-year-old Michaela Sidden. Michaela was the daughter of the host, Muriel and Jim, and she was asleep in her bed. Paul shot her once and then started to walk out of the room. But then he turned around and shot her twice more to make sure she was dead. Paul shot another one of his cousins, but he was just grazed. After the shooting, Paul fled the scene. First responders raced to the site. Unfortunately, it was too late to save 33-year-old Lisa Knight, 33-year-old Carla Marriage, 76-year-old Ramon Joseph, and 6-year-old Michaela Sitton. For three months, Patrick Knight was in a medically induced coma. The doctors did not believe he was going to survive. But against all odds, he did survive. There was a massive manhunt, but the authorities couldn't find Paul Marriage. On January 2nd, 2010, five weeks after the deadly shooting, a man named Paul Paff was watching football on TV. Paff owned a motel in Long Key, Florida, which is about 180 miles from Jupiter. As he was watching football, he knows a promo for that evening's episode of America's Most Wanted. Paff immediately recognized the man they were profiling on that episode, Paul Marriage. Paul had been staying in Paff's motel. He had checked in on December 2nd, six days after the murders. Paff checked the America's Most Wanted website and after looking at some photos, 
he was sure that the man staying at the motel was Paul Marriage. So he called the America's Most Wanted hotline and told them to send the police immediately. Within hours of his call, Paul Marriage was arrested. In October 2011, the district attorney announced that Paul accepted a plea deal. He pleaded guilty to four counts of first degree murder and three counts of attempted murder. He received life without parole instead of the death penalty. No one is precisely sure why Paul Marriage went on his murderous rampage. Some people believe he killed his sisters to punish his parents. After the rampage, Michaela's parents, Jim and Mariel Sin, along with Patrick Knight, sued Paul Marriage's parents. They claimed that they knew that their son was dangerous, and yet, they still secretly invited him to the get-together. Paul's parents filed their own lawsuit against the parents of the murdered girl. They blamed the rampage on them because they allowed Paul into their home. Their lawsuit claimed had they never let him in, the rampage would have never happened. In the end, all the lawsuits were dismissed. At the time of this video, 46-year-old Paul Marriage is serving a sentence at the Lake Correctional Institute in Claremont, Florida. Tragically, this was not the only mass murder the family experienced. Selwa Marriage Abrams, who is Paul's father's sister, had been a popular opera singer. But she gave up her career as an opera singer to be a homemaker. Selwa had been married to a pilot named James Abrams, and they had two children together, Jack and Melissa Ann. In September 1972, after 19 years of marriage, Selwa and James separated. On July 15, 1973, their divorce was finalized. The next day, James came to Selwa's home to pick up 14-year-old Jack and 10-year-old Melissa Ann. They were going out to buy scuba diving equipment. As Jack and Melissa Ann were sitting in the car, Selwa had 45-year-old James come into the master bedroom. She shot him four times in the chest with a 38 caliber revolver. Selwa then got her son Jack from the car and led him into the bedroom. She shot her son twice. Selwa reloaded the gun and then got her 10-year-old daughter from the car. She took Melissa Ann into a different bedroom and shot her as well. After Selwa shot her ex-husband and her children, she swallowed a lot of barbiturates. She fell into a coma. When the police arrived at the home, James, Jack, and Melissa Ann were all dead. Selwa, who was 43, survived for five days in the coma before she passed away. Number 1. Omaima Nelson In the fall of 1991, William Nelson was 56 years old. He lived in Casa Mesa, California. William had been a pilot, but in 1984, he was convicted of smuggling marijuana. He was sent to a federal penitentiary. He was released from prison in July 1991. After he was released, he got a job as a computer programmer and a messenger at a computer company. One night in the fall of 1991, William went out to a bar to play pool. At the bar, he met 23-year-old Omaima Stainbrook. Omaima was born in Egypt in 1968. Throughout her childhood, Omaima experienced horrible physical and sexual abuse. When she was a teenager, she married an American man. She immigrated to the United States in 1986. Not long after moving to the United States, Omaima left her husband. 
She dated older men who would lavish her with gifts and money. She wouldn't usually stay with any man for very long. Some of her ex-boyfriends said she was into rough and violent sex. In some cases, she stole money from the men she dated. Omaima eventually got work as a model and a nanny. After meeting in the bar, William and Omaima started dating. Within days of meeting each other, they were married. However, it does not appear that the marriage was legal because William was still married to his previous wife. Nevertheless, the couple had a short honeymoon. They drove out to the Midwest and they visited William's family. In the lead up to Thanksgiving 1991, the couple purchased some turkey and vegetables for their first Thanksgiving dinner together. William left work on Wednesday, November 27, 1991 for the long weekend and his co-workers and boss noticed nothing off about him. That night, a neighbor of the couple heard some odd sounds coming from their apartment. It sounded like someone was doing a lot of chopping. Over the next two days, it sounded like the garbage disposal was running nearly non-stop. On Sunday afternoon, Omaima left the apartment building in Williams Corvette. She drove over to a friend's home and showed her friend a garbage bag in the car. It had human organs wrapped in newspaper. Omaima asked her friend what was the best way to dispose of them. Her friend called the police and officers came to the apartment. Omaima was taken into custody and the police searched her apartment. They were horrified by what they found. In some plastic bags and suitcases, they found more human remains. In the freezer was a badly mutilated human head. In the deep fryer, there was human hands. In the trash, mixed with some turkey and Thanksgiving Day vegetables, the police found some more human remains. It's believed that Omaima tried to disguise the remains by making it look like it was part of the Thanksgiving dinner. The next morning, Omaima was arrested and charged with murder. She went to trial a year later in December 1992. She pleaded not guilty. Omaima testified on her own behalf. She admitted to killing her husband, but she said she acted in self-defense. She claimed that William was horribly abusive. He demanded sex three times a day, and if she didn't give in, he would beat her and rape her. After they got married, they traveled to the Midwest to visit William's family. Mamima said she had a new kitten with her. She said that on the drive back, William demanded oral sex, and she said no. Mamima claimed that William picked up the kitten and threw it out the window. He then threatened to leave her on the roadside. Mamima said she stayed with William because he always apologized after he said or did something horrible. Omaima testified that on the night before Thanksgiving, William tied her to a bed and raped her. Afterward, he freed her from her restraints. Omaima said that this was the last straw. She grabbed a pair of scissors and started stabbing William. She thought that this would kill him but it didn't. So she picked up a clothes iron and beat him until he stopped breathing. After that, Omaima said she went into a trance and dismembered the body and tried to mutilate it in a way to make sure it couldn't be identified. A psychiatrist who talked to Omaima after she was arrested testified. He had been a psychiatrist for 20 years and he said he had never seen anything so bizarre, so psychotic. The psychiatrist said that Omaima told him 
that she dressed up to dismember her husband. She put on red lipstick, a red hat, and a pair of red high heel shoes. The psychiatrist also said that Omaima said to him, I did his ribs just like in a restaurant. Afterwards, she sat at the table with his ribs and said to herself, It's so sweet. It's so delicious. I like mine tender. Omaima later denied consuming any of her husband. A detective testified, and he said that about 130 pounds of William were not recovered. Two of Omaima's ex-boyfriends testified that Omaima tied them up and threatened them with a weapon. She then stole money from them. The district attorney contended that Omaima didn't kill William because he was abusive. Instead, she killed him because she wanted his money. Supposedly, William had money from his drug smuggling days. But the police didn't find any money in the couple's apartment. Omaima denied stealing any of the money. Omaima's trial was about a month long. The jury deliberated for six days. The jury found Omaima Nelson not guilty of first degree murder. But they did find her guilty of second degree murder. Omaima Nelson was sentenced to 27 years to life in prison. In prison, Omaima has been a problematic inmate. She has refused to take any classes or do anything regarding her rehabilitation. Contraband has been found in her cell several times. She has gotten into physical altercations with correctional officers and her fellow inmates. So it wasn't surprising to anyone that she was denied parole in 2006 and 2011. In prison, Omaima married an elderly man she knew at the time of William's murder. He died and he left her a sizable inheritance. Omaima Nelson is currently incarcerated at the California Institution for Women in Chino, California. She'll be able to apply for parole again in 2026. She'll be 58 years old. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you found it interesting, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, if you are looking for something new to watch, why not check out my new channel, Chapter Dark. The videos are mysteries that you can try and solve. Do you have what it takes to solve these mysteries? You can find a link to Chapter Dark in the description box below. But that's all for today, thanks again for watching.